أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين My beloved brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين All praise be unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala نشهد ولا إله إلا الله We bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And we ask Allah to bless us and have mercy on us in this waqt of Jumu'ah May Allah guide us in what we say today, may Allah accept the du'as that we make. May Allah grant that this Jumu'ah be a kafara, a forgiveness for all the sins, the mistakes, the things we've said, done, thought, all the haram we've done this week. May Allah wash it away as we sit here in this waqt of Jumu'ah and we send our love, greetings and salutations to our beloved Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, to his pious and pure family, to his companions and all those who follow his sunnah until the end of time. May Allah bless us to be steadfast in the sunnah of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the dunya and let us be in his companionship in the akhirah. Ameen. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, as we know, uh, June is uh, youth month. And subhanallah, it is one of the areas, if those of you who were listening to the president speak last night, one of the big areas of concern for us as a ummah, and more specifically for us as a nation, is the, the, cal- or the, the situation with regards to our youth. Some very, very disturbing numbers, some disturbing things to think about. And the crisis really at which we are standing at. At this point in time, our youth situation is nothing short of a crisis. And I said this many times. That if you have a, a young son or daughter, when we talk about youth, usually it's from the age of when they moved away from being children. In Islam, we don't have this concept of, uh, of, a, of a adolescent. You're not in between. You, you, you are a child, and then you become mukallaf, and you're an adult. You're responsible. And so, when we talk about youth, we're talking about those adults from when they become mukallaf until about 35 years old. So if you're within that bracket, you're still youth. Some uncles might say, I'm in my 60s, but I still regard myself as youth. Well, alhamdulillah. But if you look at what we, what the current situation that we have as a country, if you have a young son or daughter in that bracket, that is a practicing Muslim to the best of their ability, they make their salah, they're not indulging in major haram, we all commit haram, but not of the major sins, they have their life sort of in order, they're studying or they're working, Alhamdulillah, I should be very grateful that you have a very good, in comparison, compared to what's out there, you have a very good son or daughter, you've been blessed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you. And for those youngsters, in their youth, who avoids the major sins and performs their salah, the only thing that really they require, dresses appropriately, is obedient to their parents, looks after their work, their studies. It is as if though in the climate we live in, awliya of the, walis of the awliya of Allah. May Allah bless our youth, may Allah bless us, ameen. But we have some serious problems to deal with in this country with regards to youth. If we think about it, 40 years ago, why is Youth Day, why is, May, why is June the Youth Month? Because of the uprisings, our, the young people, and some of you, I mean, 40 years ago, before my time, subhanAllah, some of you were that youth, you were those young people that stood up and actually changed a system. You brought a system to an end. You know, you started uh, uh, one of the major uh, uh, movements in bringing the change to a, a system like apartheid to its knees was the youth. I mean, young people 40 years ago changed the country. Young people a few years ago changed many countries in the Middle East. Of course, things haven't gone the way we thought and we'd hoped it would be. But young people really changed the world. And they have this ability to change the world. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always love a young person and give barakah to a young person more so than the old person. The old man that comes to the masjid five times a day, khair, barakah, very good. But the young person that comes regularly to the masjid, if not five times a day, is of a higher caliber. Because it's, it's much more difficult. So with the youth comes this izzah and this ability to change. Yet we look at our youth in South Africa and it's actually a, a sore point. It is something that we talk about negatively. That if we look at in the last 25 years, or many of those of us who are in that bracket of 15 to 35, we were, most of us were born either out of apartheid or towards the end of apartheid. Can't use, yes, apartheid's legacy is there and will be there for a long time, but we can't, there's so many opportunities that have gone missing. The youth in apartheid did more and were more successful than the young people that are now coming up in the land of opportunity. Just some numbers that will shock you, something that we you know, you, you have heard in the president's speech, that of all the kids that start in grade one, only 50% of them will actually matriculate. Meaning within that schooling, half of kids leave schooling. Half. Now if you don't have a matric, you're basically, I don't speak about our uncles and our aunties that were 
you know, 50, 60 years ago, that was a different time. But in today's day and age, if you don't have a matric, really you illiterate. You are uneducated. You know, you are not, you know, subhanallah, you are virtually unemployable. You have no skills. So you have 50% of those who start school, don't finish school. And of those who start, those who finish, a very small percentage goes on to study, goes on to not only study in the university, but they get a, a tertiary qualification. Half of these people are unemployed. So you have 50% plus of our country sitting at home doing nothing. And this is the izza. This is the strength. These are the people that drive the country forward. This group 15 to 34 are the people that really are the backbone of any country. Any country that moves forward, any group that wants to move forward, you have to have highly motivated young people. And we have, as a country, we have more than half of them sitting at home doing nothing. Subhanallah. Two-thirds of them will live in poverty and they will remain in poverty. 80% of our, when they did an analysis, 80% of our kids do not read and write on the level that is required. South Africa consistently is at the bottom in terms of literacy and numeracy. Countries that are very poor, much poorer than us, have far bigger issues. Their kids are doing better than our kids. Subjects like maths and English, which is vital for any, any form of profession, our kids, our kids, my kids, your kids, some of us who are youth, us, are not where we should be in terms of global standards. And we live in a world where we're competing with the rest of the world. Kids in South Africa are competing with kids in China and India and America. And subhanAllah, we are not, we could say even average, we at the bottom, at the lower end. Some of those numbers, the only countries we are beating in terms of doing better, in terms of numeracy, in terms of job creation, the only countries we are beating are countries like Syria, Afghanistan, countries that have been through war. That's how bad our numbers are. So, serious problem. Serious problem. And then, above that, we of course have these extra social, extraordinary social ills we have in South Africa. Violent crime. Statistic that said, half of young people that die, if people die between the age of 15 and 40 basically, half of them that die, die of non-natural causes, violent death, substance abuse, subhanAllah. So we are losing thousands, hundreds, I mean, tens of thousands of young people through avoidable causes. Each child, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every single person, we come to know Allah says, created on the fitrah, created pure, created with ability. Allah honored, and, and Allah says, I, I honored every single child of Adam, every single offspring, every child that we have is special. And then we take them, and subhanAllah, what do we do? As a result, something is wrong with the way in which we are raising our kids. So this is something that we have as a country, as a crisis. So who do we blame? Where do we start looking at the problem? Perhaps one of the areas, a statistic that I saw, I was, uh, uh, you know, about a week ago, someone came, an expert on this and spoke about it. A problem that South Africa has, and the cause of perhaps why our youth are perhaps of the worst in the world, why our youth score below the rest of the world? Why our youth are so unskilled, so unmotivated? The problem lies with the parents, or the lack of parents. They did a survey where they looked at countries, and they looked at how many parents you have in your life. So there are kids that grow up with a mom and a dad. There are kids that grow up with one father, one mother. There are kids that grow up with no parents. You grow up with, of course they have parents biologically, but they have no guardians in terms of parents looking after them. And in a survey of, I think 50 countries, South Africa is right at the bottom. Only 36, now listen to this, think about this. Only 36% of the kids in our, in South Africa know about having a mother and a father in their house. Only 36%. About 50% of the kids in South Africa have only one parent. And the majority would be a single mom. Meaning, we have a crisis of missing fathers. The problem, if you want to really put your finger on it, are the dads. Now last week, we know Youth Day and Father's Day coincided. Mona Yasin gave a wonderful khutbah about dads. And this is the problem. There are no good male role models for many, many of our kids. Either the father is completely absent, don't know where he is. Or he's uninterested. I know where he is, but he doesn't really impact my life. If he's there, he doesn't show a good example from a deen or a dunya perspective. Maybe, subhanAllah, if he's there financially, emotion is not there. And we know with the rise of divorce, 50% of marriages don't work out. May Allah protect us. 
It's so easy for fathers to walk away. That they're not involved in kids' lives. Now, when a child grows up, I mean, even more scary than that, 20% of the kids don't have a mother or father being raised by Gogo's grandparents. Dangerous. What do we expect is going to happen? It's a time bomb. It is a time bomb. We were not given, Allah did not give this country the worst of the lot. When he put the youth in the different countries, he gave South Africa the rejects. No. Our kids are just as smart, as just as able as the kids in China, America, wherever it might be. But then we take them and we mess them up, unfortunately. The problem lies in our parenting, our schooling, leaders. We are the, at fault here. And it's not just a financial thing. It's not just a money thing. There's much bigger issues to discuss. So this is one of the areas that is very, very scary. Britain did a study. They called it the longest study in the history of Britain. What they would do is they would take a sample of young kids are born, 100, 200,000 kids, all born the same time. And they track their lives, rich, poor, different backgrounds, and they track their lives over 20, 30, 40 years. See what thing, who became, some of them became successful, some failed, some lived long, some died, some had diseases. And they looked at their lives and they tried to think, well, if we wanted to put down what are the key ingredients for success in your life? We take a newborn baby. What things must we give this child so that this child will succeed in life? The number one thing, the number one factor that will bring about success, what this study has proven, the longest study in Britain, from World War II until now they're doing the study. Thousands of people they surveyed. The things that make most kids that are successful is that they have good parents in their life. That's the number one thing. You can have, I mean, you can come from a poor family, poverty. Poverty, of course, is negative. If you come from a poor family, chances are to be very difficult for you to get into a good school, difficult to get into university. You'll, it's a cycle of poverty. But you can break that cycle if you have good, a good upbringing. And upbringing means parents. We'll talk about what is a good parent. That, I mean, that's the crux of our khutbah today. M- my jumu'ah, about, it's a youth jumu'ah, but most of the faces here, alhamdulillah, are, 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 are working people, uncles, and most of you are dads. I don't see too many kids here. So for you, for me, I'm a father as well. It's scary that my kids, my child, my children might be this, in this negative statistic. Drop out of school. Substance abuse. May Allah protect, may Allah protect us. We can only do so much, yes, as parents. But by and large, we as a country are failing. So this study proved that if you bring your children up in a certain way, no matter how many things are going against them, you can break the cycle of poverty. They can come out of it. Your kids can go further. And they looked at certain things like they said. Parents that read to their kids, the children are five, and they read to them daily. Those children in their 30s had higher qualifications. Think about that. Just by reading half an hour a day to our kids at the age of five. And they said by the age of ten when they're in primary school, taking an interest in their work. Not, don't do their work for them, but know what they're doing. Let me see your report card. Have you done your homework? Just by doing these things, when those kids are 30, many of them were successful. The steps we do now will impact the outcome of our kids long term. They said, for example, one of the key focus is having a constant open dialogue with your kids parents, children that were successful we asked them how did you get here many of them most of them yes they are always the odd one out but the majority of people that are successful they will tell you we had a big influence from our parents and many of you here alhamdulillah you've qualified you're professional people you are above average this juma this masjid as you're sitting here you will all tell me you had a positive influence in your upbringing from a father a mother both a parent, somewhere along the line, you came from a good environment. Majority of us, all of us, we, we stand here with that. And that's what the study is proving. Now, if the most important factor in a child's upbringing or child's success is the parents that raise them, how do we, what do we expect when 70% of our kids in this country don't have two parents? 70%. Is there any reason why it's not, it's not a, a shock that 50% of these kids will not go on to amount to much. They won't achieve anything. They, they, in that lies really the problem. So really parenting is the ingredient for success. And we don't need fancy studies. We don't need scientists to tell us this. We don't need stats essay to tell us this. Allah told us this in the Quran. We know the story of Surah Kaf. 
Nabi Musa and Khidr والسلام, they are on a journey. Nabi Musa is learning from Khidr things he did not know. And he meets different people. He meets the people on the boat. He meets the boy who Nabi Khidr kills. It's a different time, different discussion. But the last situation, they come to a city, a town. And these townspeople were really terrible people. I mean, they were bad. They didn't even give them a glass of water. Two anbiya of Allah. Two of the closest people to Allah, not a cent or an in their pocket. They're asking, just give us a glass of water, a piece of bread. And these people says, get lost. I don't want to see Bekhis. Go, go. Leave our city. And so as they're about, they're obviously clearly frustrated and angry that they leave the city. And Khidr alayhi salam, as he passes out the city, he sees this wall about to collapse and he starts fixing it. And Abi Musa is really frustrated. He's tired. He's hungry. And he says, Passingly, why you can ask these people for some money, at least ask them for money. You're fixing their wall, ask them for payment. And so Khidr explains why he's doing this. And he says, as for the wall, why I'm fixed, why fix the wall? It belonged to two orphan boys in the city, and there was beneath it a treasure for them. Under this wall is some money. That time they didn't have banks, so you had to hide your money. Under this wall, there's money. And their father was a good man. Their father was a righteous man. وَأَبُوهُمَا صَالِحَا Their father was salih. He was a good man. So, your Lord intended that they should reach when they become mature, that they should extract this treasure as a mercy from your Lord. Here we see, subhanAllah. Allah is saying, the reason why He is bringing financial success to these kids is because they had a good father. Now, their father, they are orphans, meaning their father died. The father wasn't really in their life, even, bef- you know, their whole life. He died early, but he was a good man. He made dua for them. In fact, it just shows you the kind of man he was. He put a treasure aside for my kids one day. I can't be there. He's thought about when they grow up, I want to leave something for them. This was a good dad. And so Allah says, I will look after these children. Allah is telling you and me that if we want success in our kids' life, we should be, the first step comes from us. Because Allah has given us kids that are pure, that are sinless, that have full potential, that are clean slate. Yet we are the problems. And similarly, anyone here that is successful, Alhamdulillah, yes, you've worked hard. Anyone here that has moved forward in life, if you don't realize it, many times the success in our life is not because of us. It's because we had a good father or mother. They maybe couldn't help us with our studies. They couldn't sit with books. We maybe went further than academically. But their du'as are the things that got us through. It wasn't our smarts. It wasn't us sitting there and doing exams and working hard in the, work, in the office. The financial blessings in these kids' life came because they had a pious, good father. So Allah is saying, one of the ingredients for success in the kids is through the parents. And the opposite is true as well. That if the parents fail, that failure has a knock-on effect on kids to come. It has a knock-on effect. And of course, parents will, that's what Allah says, as Mulna, uh, as, as Sheikh Yasin said last week, Allah says to you and me, especially the men, your kids are fitna. For us, we have a special questioning on Qiyamah. If you have all your ducks in the row in terms of your personal life, if you failed your kids, those kids will testify against you and me on the day of Qiyamah. Their failures will be blamed on us. And some of it will might be legitimate. We'll have to answer, where were we? What did we do? So we in South Africa have a problem with dads. Really, the problem lies with our dads. And I get calls, subhanAllah, so many calls. Sisters, Sheikh, my husband has left me. Uh, we all argued, talaq, it's inevitable, it happens. Can't do anything about that. But now that he's gone, he's completely absent from a financial aspect, let alone an emotional aspect in the kid's life. You can divorce your wife. You can divorce your in-laws. You can't divorce your children. And in fact, that financial responsibility of your children will remain your financial responsibility until they're old enough to care for themselves. Your daughters, for example, until she gets married, she will be your financial responsibility. Even if the kids don't speak to you anymore. Even if the kids don't do their duty towards you as a parent. It's an amana, it's a responsibility. You don't pay the rent, you don't pay the electricity, you don't pay your, your bills when you feel like it. You pay it because you have to do it. And that's Subhanallah, so many dads are absent. And that's the financial part. That's the easy part. Being in, in, involved in the kids' lives, being physically present, growing them, nurturing them, teaching them, that is sadly, sadly very absent. I look at the young men, sadly. 
It's very sad for me when you speak to 18, 19, 20 year olds and you ask them, okay, they want to get married, mashallah, fantastic. Tell me about your goals, your ambitions, your dreams. Don't have anything really. We'll see, we'll just see how it goes. No dreams, no ambitions. We are our men. We are the men. You go to Islamic classes, even secular classes. You find the girls are studious, studying, working out. Yes, there are exceptions. We have, mashallah, very good, good youngsters, but they are the minority. We are our men. We are the young men of this ummah, of this nation. So it's a, it's a bad, you know, situation. And the numbers yesterday we saw, the president confirmed it. It confirms statistic of statistic. The problem lies in our men. We have to step up. And it's a time bomb, subhanallah. It's getting worse. What will that generation be? The generation that didn't grow up with a father or a mother. Doesn't have an education. What are your, alter, your options when you're at the age of 30, 35? You're married, you have your own kids now. What's going to happen? It's going to become worse in the next generation. So the responsibility is very, very big. And this is confirmed in a hadith where the Prophet says, agreed upon by Bukhari and Muslim. The Prophet says, every child is born in the state of fitrah. Meaning, Allah has given each and every one of us a, pi- a pure child. There are no rejects. No rejects. These children came from Allah, from His side, perfect. But the parents, Allah, the Prophet says, Yahawidani, made them Jews, Christians, fire worshippers, Muslims, made them studious, made them lazy. Yes, of course, everyone ultimately will take their own sins, but the parents had a major influence. The Prophet is saying, us as parents, we are the ones that have a major influence in how our kids turn out. So the responsibility is real, and more so on dads. So how do we be a great parent? This is the question. And what guidance do we have? So Mawlana Yasin gave some guidances. And I want to take inshallah this opportunity to mention, I was, while I was doing this khutbah, office, after work yesterday. My managers, yes, I have to say after work yesterday. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues said, is there anyone in the Quran that we can really look up as a great dad? And he's a super dad in the Quran. We'll talk about him inshallah. What made him a super dad? So Mawlana Yasin mentioned last week, one of the things, if you look at the Anbiya, the Awliya, Allah confirms this in the Qur'an as well, that one of the things good parents do is they make dua con- constantly for their kids, for their family. Even before they are born, you find Nabi Ibrahim making dua. He's an old, alayhi salam, he was an old man when he got Nabi Ismail. But he's making dua from basically, from when he's married. Nabi Zakaria is standing in the mihrab, all he's asking for is a good, pious child. They are making dua before they are born even. And Allah mentions, we did said this from the Ibadur Rahman, the special people, the special servants of Allah. One category of them is the ones Allah says, what do they do? They make a dua. All they do is they make this dua. What do they do? Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa dhurriyatina kurrata ayn wajalna lil muttaqina imama. Meaning they consistently, continuously, daily, every salah, they make this dua. Ya Allah, let bist- grant me from my family, my wives, or my husband, if you're the wife, and my children to be the coolness of my eyes. And let us be leaders of the muttaqin. Meaning, let us not just be good people, let us be of the best people. They make this dua continuously. You can make this dua, you know, it's a good time. Try to, I speak to myself first, inculcate this, make this dua after, before you say, Assalamu alaikum as in salah, make this dua. After the tahiyyah, it's a mubarak time to make dua, make this dua there. Let everyone just try making this dua. Ya Allah, let our kids, my wife, my children, my family, be the coolness. May they be good in this dunya and in the akhirah. Basically, that's what we ask. Istikrar also, when this is kurrata ayun, one of the tafsirs of this means those, the eyes are fixed on them. Coolness of the eyes also means that they not only bring me happiness, it means I'm always watching over them. Let me always be in their life. Let me always be present in their life. And therefore Allah says, He rewards them for their sabr. Why sabr? What has this got to do with sabr? Meaning it's a constant a job of a dad and a mom. There's no leave, public holidays. No sick days even, subhanAllah. Especially for the moms, there's no sick days. When you're sick, you're still on the job. It requires patience. I mean, there's never a time you can say, I switch off as a dad. You know, I just need a time not to think, not to worry, not to be involved. Allah says, that, that's why He rewards you for being patient. Because you were constantly involved in the upbringing of these children. So make dua. Before you have kids, make dua. For those of you who are not married, those of you who are you know, looking to have kids, make dua. Already now, Ya Allah, bless me with pious kids. When you have kids, of course, we have to. 
and of course continue as they grow up. No matter how old they are, the dua of the parent is always mustajab. Uh, Mawlana Yasin gave examples, a very excellent example. They asked Sheikh Sudais, Imam of the Haram, how did you become the Imam of the Haram? So he said, I became the Imam because I was a very naughty child. What do you mean? Very, very naughty. And every time my mom would be frustrated with me, she would say, you're so naughty. May Allah make you the Imam of the Haram one day. And she used to make dua for every time he was naughty, her dua for him, you will be the Imam of the Haram one day. You'll be the, he says, I mean, it's on YouTube, you can check it. But subhanallah, if you have a child that's very naughty, make a good dua every time they do something naughty. That is the reason why. We said, and this comes, we know, it goes without saying, lead by example, kids will follow in our footsteps. If we want our kids, so if we look at our kids and we're not happy with who they are, from a deen perspective, from a dunya perspective, they're not reading enough, they're not, you know, in the masjid enough, then it begins with us. It begins with us. Everything we want in our kids, we need to start doing it. And maybe, subhanallah, it's out of our comfort zone. We want that, so we need to lead. We want them to be uh, um, involved in certain things, we need to get involved. They are parents, subhanallah, and they never had the opportunity, for example, to recite Qur'an. But they want their kids to recite Qur'an. And I admire those dads who themselves, they will come with their kids and say, just as you start reciting, Kul Wallahu Ahad, I'm also going to recite with the Imam, Kul Wallahu Ahad. We will learn together. There was a dad uh, from, in Australia, he was from Pakistan. He, his kids were not in, like, you know, they were, you know, being in a Western society, they were moving away from Islam. So he said, let us learn. I want, I, it's pointless me telling you, learn, listen to all these bayans and lectures. Let us read and study the Qur'an together and discuss it together. And he said, subhanAllah, when at the end of that journey, yes, he benefited. But then they also, obviously, alhamdulillah, came back towards him. He said, make a deal with me. I will support you whatever you want. But let us go through this journey together. He realized it's not something as a parent I can tell you. Do this, and I don't fulfill that. Announcements? Okay. Oh. Right, so we're talking about leading by example. And lead with affection and love. Allah describes this to the Anbiya. He tells the Anbiya, that when you look after and you guide, guide with love first. Your kids need to know you love them. And you know what's amazing about love? Now we understand this with other relationships. You know, you can't tell your wife the day you get, and obviously the day you get married you say this, um, sweetie, I love you, and I'm not going to say this again. When this, if it changes, I will let you know. For now, that's the default. I don't need to tell you every day. It's not going to work. In fact, even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we cannot tell Allah, that we, we worship you, we love you. And when that changes, I will let you know. No, we have to express that love daily, five times a day. Express that iman. You can't say, Ya Allah, I believe in you and that's it. No, you need to express that continuously. You need to show it continuously. And this, subhanAllah, is a vital requirement. We have scientific studies that prove this now. Now in the past, you might have dads that never said, I love you. To anyone, right? not even to, maybe to the mom. I love you, mommy. But never to the wife. The kids, they would never hear these things because that's the dad, you know? And not even, that's the dad that's present. The dads that are never even there. But today we know that it is vital for the success of, of, a, of, a, of an individual to feel, to know, to be shown the love of their parents. And the Prophet ﷺ showed this so many times, kissing his, his grandkids, his own kids. You know, the Nabi Wasallam a few months before he died, now he's in his 60s. Fatima, his baby, his daughter, she's in a, she's a big girl, big lady. And Aisha says, the Prophet Wasallam, Aisha says, Fatima comes into the house and the Prophet gets up from his chair and he says, come my daughter, like a, like a young girl, come you sit here. This is the Rasulullah Wasallam, the kind of way he expresses his love to his kids. We know the hadith, so many hadith, the Nabi Wasallam was making sujood for so long, one Sahabi says, I got up and look, hey, what's going on? Why is the Nabi Wasallam taking so long in sujood? And I saw Hassan on his back, riding him, riding the Nabi like a horse. This is a fard salah. SubhanAllah, I did that. My son got on my back, you know, subhanAllah, I don't know, I throw him off and you get upset with me. Where are we, subhanAllah? And then he said to the Sahaba, I didn't want to disturb Hassan's play. Hassan was playing on my back and I wanted him to finish playing and then I got up. This is salah for Allah. Now, showing that level of love, do we do that? We don't do it enough. Now, again, you, we're going to have to give our kids bad news sometimes. We're going to tell them that there are things that they can't do, they don't want, things that are not nice. As leaders, as teachers, as managers, as whatever we are, we obviously lead. This is our understanding of leadership. You lead with love. I care about you. I want what's best for you. And then when I tell you the things you don't want to hear, you know it's coming from a place of love. It will not work. Allah says this to the Prophet ﷺ. It is by the mercy of Allah that you are affectionate to them. But if you were fadlan ghalid, if you were stern of heart, they would have left you. Abu Bakr would have left you. 
They wouldn't have listened to what you said. It must come from a place of love. And they, kids, our kids should be safe and secure in that. Aisha says, when all, when Allah wills good for the members of a household, when Allah wants good for that family, He instills in them affection, that they are good to one another. And again, it begins with the dads. Begins with the dads. So we're talking about the super dad of the Quran. And the super dad of the Quran is the man that you hear so many times, the father, the children of Israel. The children of Israel. Who's Israel? Not the country in the Middle East. Israel is Nabi Ya'qub. Nabi Ya'qub, alayhi salam, the grandson of Nabi Ibrahim, father of Nabi Yusuf. The Anbiya, when Allah speaks about them, He speaks about their challenges with the people. He speaks about their teaching, da'wah, Nabi Ibrahim, Nabi Nuh. When Allah speaks about Nabi Ya'qub, you almost don't see a Nabi. You see a father. You just see a dad speaking to his kids. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing from this man what it means to be a great dad. And so much so that all the Anbiya, they didn't say the children of Ibrahim, the offspring of Ishaq, they said the offspring of Ya'qub. All of them, Bani Israel. We are the sons of, Israel, of Ya'qub because he's a super dad. And we don't, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't tell us a list of lessons. You need to extract it here and there. And we look at his dialogue with his sons. So of the things that, uh, I mean, we said last week, we add on to those lessons. Number one, be present. The first thing we have, Nabi Ya'qub is talking to his son, Yusuf. Young boy. And Nabi Yusuf says, Qala Yusuf li abihi ya abati. Oh my dear father. Now he's a young boy. I saw in my dream, I saw in my sleep, 10, uh, ahada ashra kawkaban, 11 stars, and the moon, and I saw them making sujood to me. You can see it's the, the dialogue of a child. I saw them making sujood, and I saw them, you know, he's almost stumbling over his words. And Nabi Ya'qub is sitting and listening. He's got 12 other sons. We don't know. We've, he's got 12 sons in total. With how many daughters? How many wives? He's a Nabi of Allah. He's teaching. He's got all these. He's a busy man. Busier than you and me. Wallah, he's busier than you and me. But he's listening to his young six, seven year old child. And his cha- ta- child is telling him about dreams. Now the fact that this child felt so open and confident to speak about his dreams to his father. And he felt so, in the first person I want to tell is daddy. It's something special. Because do our kids do that with us? Do they feel open to speak about their dreams, their fears, their hopes, their desires, their problems? Do they feel confident enough? Yeah, you, you see, the first thing that Nabi Yusuf comes, he's a bit disturbed by the dream, he goes to his dad's. So do we have regular conversations? That study that Britain did, the longest study, they said of the success factors, make you know conversation time every day with your kids. Every child, have like 15 minutes, have a chat with him. Not telling them what to do, what not to do, not shouting at them. Just what you hear what's in them, on their mind. Make time for them to read and make time to have a conversation with them. So have regular conversations. And if you can't answer these questions, what are your kids interested in? What are they watching? Who are their friends? Are they into sports? Are they into games? What is their interest? What are their goals? He's talking about goals and dreams like this is an actual dream. What about their dreams in the future? If we don't know, then we don't have a relationship with our kids. Here you see Nabi Yaqub is present. He knows all of his kids. And he will come and say something to Nabi Yusuf about your brothers. Don't say this to your brothers. Because he knew them as well. He had an intimate relationship with all of them. Then Nabi Yaqub makes Nabi Yusuf feel very special. And every parent needs to make every child. And yes, subhanAllah, you have some kids that do well, naturally. And you have kids that, subhanAllah, at 30 you're still going to be worried. Are they still going to be at home playing games? It's reality, but each one needs to be made to feel special. That's your job as a parent. If we give up on our kids as parents, then the world is going to be a much more harsher place to them. Yes, we can't also sugarcoat reality. Just as much as we give the medicine, we need to also advise and make them feel special. Nabi Yaqub is basically then says to Nabi Yusuf that this is how Allah has chosen you. Of the tafsir of this is Nabi Yaqub saying it, that Allah has chosen you, has made you special, meaning you'll be a Nabi. And through you, Allah is going to favor you and his entire family. As he had favored Nabi Ibrahim before. You are a special young boy. At seven years old, Nabi Yaqub is saying, you will grow up to be a great man. And we know, besides being a Nabi, Nabi Yusuf will grow up to save millions of lives. He becomes an accountant, basically. Finance, finance minister of Egypt. And through his policies... He has the confidence to say to the king of Egypt, while he's in jail, he says, I can do the job better than anyone else. Without praising myself, I can, I know what to, I'm doing. And he saves an entire civilization. He had that confidence from his dad. His dad told him as a young boy, you will grow up to be someone great. And you will bring great honor to this family 
But many great people, like your grandfather Ibrahim, you will be like him. Now, subhanallah, nothing wrong to say these things to our kids. Nothing wrong. And the Nabi Sallallahu would do this. And he would give them, make every sahabi felt I was the special sahabi. We know the famous hadith of Amr ibn al-As. Who do you love the most? Must be me. Because everyone felt number one. So every child should feel, I am, I am daddy's favorite. And I am the special one. Everyone should feel that way. And they should work towards that. Then of course, it's not just about love. and There needs to be sound advice. There needs to be some guidance. You know, we've been in life, we've had 30, 40 years of experience over them. We've seen it, we know what life is like. And therefore, our job is to impart that wisdom. As the Anbiya, we're really doing the work of the Anbiya with our kids. We impart that guidance. So here we see an example of this in Nabi Yaqub. Nabi Yaqub's sons, 11 of them, or 10 of them, they are going to Egypt. And they need to, and they're going to be in a sort of a, a, difference, a difficult story. Now these are big guys. They are like in their 30s, 40s. They are big men them already. They have children. And he already, as a father, he tells them, Oh, my sons, don't enter the city from one gate, but enter from different gates. Why? I don't want you, a, a gang of 10 young men walking into a city might attract negative attention. They might already, the police might ask you what's happening, you know. So he says, don't make a spectacle of yourselves. Go from different gates. He's already, he's giving them, even as, as old as they are, he's already giving them wisdom. He's advising them always, you know. Sometimes we should listen to the advice of our grandmothers, our fathers, you know. They might not know what it is in a corporate world or, you know, they've never worked in these kind of environments. But subhanAllah, they, there's wisdom in that advice. Now to the kids of Yaqub, they thought, that is mad, man. Ten of us, we must all now each go to a different gate. This means nothing. And Allah says in the next ayah, Nabi Yaqub was given great wisdom. He knew what you, he, he understood things that you don't understand. He understood people. So as parents, we give advice. Doesn't mean they can take that. They will always take the advice, but we always give them. Look at this hadith. The Prophet also says, the best blessing or the best gift a father can give his children is to teach them good manners. If you take away one hadith of this whole lecture, take this hadith. You cannot give your kids good manners if you don't have it. You cannot ask your kids to speak nicely to their friends when you are shouting at their mother. You can't ask your kids to be punctual on salah and you neglect through all salah. To be honest and you dishonest in your business. Can't happen. To be diligent in class when you don't work properly at work. Respect your teachers when you don't respect the people around you. They will learn from what they see. Take this hadith. Our kids are, for the most part, a reflection of us. Number seven, now Nabi Yaqub's kids, they messed up time and time again. Many, many times. In fact, as we know, they threw Nabi Yusuf in the well. Last time he trusted them to do something, he gave them the car, they crashed the car. They, he gave them the night out, they messed up. Now they've said, we've changed, we want to be better. And then they said, let us go once again, give us another opportunity. Nabi Yaqub feels, I, I'm not... I'm not comfortable, but they insisted, and so he says, fine, I'll trust you. Qala, he said, never will I send with you, your brother, your younger brother, until you give me a swear, say, sumba by Allah, swear by Allah, that you will bring him back to me. Promise me you'll be in by 10 o'clock. Promise me if I give you the car, you're not going to speed. Promise me if you go to your friend's house, you'll be there. We have to give, we have to give a bit of leeway also. We have to give them a chance to grow up. And if they say so, even though I said these kids, they lost one brother already. Nabi Yaqub gave them Yusuf, they lost him. Now they say, give us the next brother. Years have passed by, 20 years or so. We, are not, we, we promise we're going to be good this time. And he trusted them. He gave them a second chance. Part of that training, some parents are overly controlling. And subhanAllah, even when they get married, you want to control those sons. Tell them how they should be. SubhanAllah, part of, you know, you raise them up to let them go. Let them go. Prepare them to the best of your ability. Then you need to give them the trust to go. Some of you have young kids. Some of you have teenage kids. I see some people say, yeah, like nodding yes. Because, you know, obviously if it's a five-year-old child, don't give them that. You know, you know your kids where they are in life. Not all kids. So this applies for different kids. These kids were old now. These are big children of Nabi Yaqub. They messed up. But now they're coming to their dad. Give us an opportunity. Part of us is part of that. Nabi Sallallahu had this ability in terms of leadership. He would appoint young leaders. Young Sahaba give them very, very, very complicated tasks because he believed in them. And yes, they will mess up. But how are they going to learn? How are they going to learn otherwise? And when they mess up, because again these kids, so they had one brother, they must lost him. A second brother, they lost him again. So they've messed up. And now they come to their dad and they say, Oh, our father, istaghfir lana dhunubana. Ask Allah to forgive us. 
and have mercy on us. Indeed, we have, we, we were wrong, we committed sin. And so he said, I will ask Allah for you from my Lord forgiveness. Indeed, he's off forgiving, most merciful. Now, many of you, I don't know your relationship with your dads or your kids. When you do something wrong, perhaps the last person you want to inform is your dad. You would rather tell everyone, anyone, the police even, than let your dad know. And your kids might be the same, subhanAllah. They would be in the biggest crisis of their life. Dangerous stuff. But this is so long as my parents don't know. They might be in and over their head. Be in a situation they can't control. But they won't pick up their phone and call their parents. SubhanAllah. The, our kids should know. And they will mess up. You will mess up. I will mess up. Every person will mess up. They must know that at the end of the day, mom and dad have our backs. Yes, they, they will fix it. We might get a hiding. We might get some something afterwards. But they're going to first save us from the situation. When I'm drowning, I can go to them. Sad. I know people very close. that Not close to me, but I mean people that... Take their lives, commit suicide because life became too much. They didn't have the courage to speak to their own parents. Now that, re- that relationship is built up from years. Where they can pick up the phone and say, relationships, something's wrong. Job, there's something wrong. Whatever, big problems in life, debt, I have a problem. I can pick up the phone and speak to my, my parents. If you don't have that, it's a big, big loss in life. And throughout your life, many of you are older than me. You know, having a parent, even if they're 60, 70, 80, to pick up the phone and just speak to them. Even though they can't do much besides dua, it just helps knowing that they are there. I've got your back. Nabi Yaqub, as I said, these kids were not, I mean, none of your kids, I hope, lost two of their siblings. I hope none of your kids did that. They lost two of their brothers and their the two brothers. These kids lost two of their brothers, and yet they still go to Nabi Yaqub and say, Daddy, make dua for us. We made, we made a mistake. They hurt him the most. And he said, I will make dua for you. I will be there for you. I will stand between you and Allah, begging Allah to forgive you. SubhanAllah. They knew their dad was on their side. And when things are down and bad, your parents should always be there and we as parents should always give hope. So when things were so bad for them, Nabi Yaqub says to them, Oh my sons, even though you've lost two brothers, go out and look for them. Ask about Yusuf and his brother and don't ever despair in the relief from Allah. Don't ever lose hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When life is bad, he's telling his kids, when you are down, you've hit rock bottom. The dad tells his sons, never lose hope in Allah. It is only, لا يَئِسُ مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْقَوْمُ الْكَافِرِينَ Only a true disbelief, only a person who has no iman, loses hope in Allah. He's telling them, don't ever give up. And Nabi Yaqub is the one hurting the most, because it's his sons. And he's telling them, don't lose hope, keep going in life. No matter how bad things are, your parents will always be there for you. And then lastly, and this is the point, subhanAllah, no matter how frustrating it is, how tiring it is, I know sometimes we just want, some, those of us who have young kids, just, you know, getting to the toilet is like a break from, from the kids, you know. You can never, we can never stop worrying and showing our care and concern for them. On his deathbed, on his deathbed, Allah takes Nabi Yaqub right towards the end. He's dying, he's about to meet Allah. When you're dying, all you can think about is nafsi, nafsi myself. At his deathbed, Allah says, were you there when Nabi Yaqub was about to die? And what did he say? Asking his sons, what are you going to worship? after me. When I go, who will you worship? And they said, we'll worship your Lord, the one Lord, the Lord of our forefathers, Ibrahim and Ismail and Ishaq. Right until his end, he's not worried about Maliki al He's not worried about, of course, he's worried about these things. Jannah, I'm going to meet Allah. But he's worried more. My kids, what's going to happen to you after I'm gone? They're big people. One of them is an Abi of the Anbiya of Allah. And he still sees them as small children. Tell me, my boys, what are you going to worship after me? We cannot stop caring. And showing our care and concern. Even if they don't listen. Even if they don't. We can only give advice. When they're younger, yes, we can have more control. When they get older, we can just give advice, give love, give support, give affection. Give a good example. And just keep making dua. So I ask Allah to bless you and me. Our kids, your kids, my kids. May Allah grow, grow them up to be the coolness of our eyes. And to be in the care and the love of Allah. May Allah grow, grant our youth, all the youth of this country. To be people that are special. That will lead this country and this world forward. May we, go, may we live long and see our kids become truly leaders of goodness. That we can be proud that parental that's good. That, that good parent, parental pride. Our kids are something special. Because they are special. May Allah help us. All of us. Amen. Quick comments. Uh, quick uh, notices. Uh, birthday. Haji Fatima Ghafoor. Uh, wife of late Haji Hassan Ghafoor. I uh, will be celebrating her 96th uh, birthday, mashallah, on the 23rd of June. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, uh, to grant uh, Haji Fatima all the strength and good health. May Allah grant her uh, many, many more years.
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted du'as and blessed her and her family. Ameen. Then I must apologize to my class two weeks in a row. I've missed my class. Both are, you know, I didn't realize that we had a, we had, there was a traffic issue. So, but inshallah, Monday, six o'clock, our class will resume, inshallah. And we are, we'll still work on the back to basics. When the WhatsApp goes out, we'll go out, inshallah. Shukran so much. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.